Hey guys, Super Horror Bro Mike here, and in today's video, we take a look at the mysterious hidden story within cursed lost Nintendo 64 game, Shipwrecked 64. Although a quick disclaimer must be given. For those who are asking after my playthrough of the game, no, this is not a real game, it's just a fun indie horror game springboarding off the haunted game cartridge concept. And so with that in mind, sit back, relax, and let's dive into another episode of Horror Games Explained. This is the story of Shipwreck 64. So what is Shipwreck 64? Well, as the game's introductory sequence explains, Shipwrecked had a short-lived launch in the year 1997. As so few cartridges were produced, it soon became lost to time, and a rare collector's item. The developers of a version of Shipwreck 64, now available to download online, claim they purchased the original copy from an eBay seller named Daniel. They then ripped the game assets and rebuilt it exactly as they found it, so it could be replayed on computers around the world, faithfully recreating the game glitches and all, but also warned that it's not for the faint of heart, as they uncovered some disturbing material along the way. This brings us to the game itself, so let's take a look at what Shipwreck 64 is all about. From the beginning, Shipwreck 64 gives off a very creepy vibe. The game's introduction shows realistic looking animal mascots on a sailboat out at sea. Their appearance is unnerving and a far cry from the cutesy cartoon counterparts seen during gameplay. These mascot characters are Bucky the Beaver, Olive Otter, Giovanni Goose, and Walter Warus. An ocean storm forces the friends to head to a nearby island, where they end up shipwrecked, hence the title of the game. From here the player assumes the role of Bucky, as he searches the island for his friends. Bucky soon discovers a gang of wolves has taken his friends captive as penance for ruining the peace of the island. Bucky must now complete a series of mini-games in order to save his captive friends. In Olive Otter's minigame, we are tasked with collecting up to 20 coconuts within a strict time limit to appease the wolves. While in Giovanni Goose's minigame, we must be sure to turn off various ovens while cooking for the wolves before they catch fire. Then, in Walter the Walrus's minigame, players must reach the shipwrecked boat so Walter can repair it. However, a darkness stalks the player and captures Bucky if he moves when the lights go out. Bucky even has a minigame of his own, where the wolves lock him in a maze full of treasure chests and demand the poor beaver collect up enough loot for them before a demonic entity catches him. After all of these minigames are successfully completed, Bucky and his friends can head back to the beach where the fixed up ship awaits. Boarding it leads to the first of several endings. So, with the surface story, characters, and gameplay loop explained, let's turn our attention to each ending and how to unlock them, as well as diving into the dark underbelly of this seemingly innocent video game. The first ending is unlocked simply by completing each of the four aforementioned minigames and then boarding the boat on the beach with Bucky's friends. If we do this, then the following text appears on a blank screen. And with that, Bucky and his friends sailed away. The end. While this is a happy outcome, in reality this is Shipwreck 64's bad ending. It gives us no information about the real story at play beneath the game's charming exterior. To get to the more sinister events, we must instead dig a little deeper. You see, by failing the minigames rather than successfully completing them, a number of disturbing movie files play out. During Walter's Shipwreck minigame, if we allow the darkness to ensnare Bucky, then we are treated to the following movie clip. This sequence shows someone exploring an office building by night before being attacked by Bucky the Beaver, or someone in a Bucky suit at least. Failing Giovanni Goose's cooking themed minigame also provides us with a murderous Bucky clip this time attacking another person before cooking them on a stove, their goose well and truly cooked. Next up we must fail Olive Otter's coconut collecting game. 
In a sinister turn, slapping Olive actually knocks the timer right down. This leads to a very peculiar audio recording where we hear the voice of a woman named Olivia. Hello, this is Olivia Finch. I'd like to please submit a complaint. Anonymously, please. Brandon has been showing up every night to my residence. Uh, Brandon Lester, you know, the other costume guy? He just walks by, still wearing the suit, uh, sometimes just placing his hand on the window. Other times, he'd grab the sliding glass door, uh, jiggle the handle around, uh, like he wanted in. I'll wear the dead eyes of that stupid costume stare back at me. La last night, though, is the reason I'm doing this. Uh, Brandon walked over and, and, and just began to slam his head against the door. I don't know why, but it kept me up for the several hours this went on. He only left it around four in the morning, stumbling away, leaving a gross stain all over the window. Um, please, please, just, just deal with him. I, I can't afford to keep losing sleep. After each of these creepy cutscenes, we are quickly shown a medical sheet relating to the mascot in question. More on this in the final section of this video, where we take a look at the secret story behind the game. Finally, we have Bucky's minigame. The objective here is to allow the mascot to be consumed by the demon prowling the maze. After being caught several times, the following message plays out. There is nothing for you here. If we choose to leave the island at this point, then one of two endings play out. The first occurs if we fail to uncover all secrets hidden within the stage. Secrets leading to the exposure of the medical documents for which there should be a total of four. This ending shows highly distorted and scary looking versions of the main cast, sailing away on their boats after escaping the island. However, this is not the true ending, but rather a creepy extra. To unlock the real ending, we must locate each of Shipwreck 64's secret rooms. These are not terribly hard to find, but can only be accessed after failing each character's minigame. If we enter these previously locked doors and retrieve the documents within, then after boarding the boat, a new sequence plays out. It features a freaky wooden doll, and messages instruct us to seek out these relics across the island, gather them up, and then bring them to the campsite. With each doll we collect, new backstory is revealed. This backstory tells us of Shipwreck 64's origins. A game developer named Connor was hired to create a game for the Bucky Beaver franchise, but after Connor failed to faithfully bring the creation to life, he was fired by Bucky's creator, Mark Mullins. Connor, look, it, it doesn't even look like Bucky. What? <sighs> Buddy, you, you know what I mean. Look, this, this is Bucky. This is the face millions around the world recognize as a pop culture icon. That is a beaver in a blue suit. Connor, you're, you're telling me with the vast amount of characters that we own, you picked up some random wolf and dropped him into the game? We're not making this game for your son, Connor. We're making this game for the millions of people who look up to our brand. Look, I'll... I'll give it to you straight. Do you have any idea how much money your company sunk into studio grounds? Do you really think we can extend our generosity to you for that much longer to create this? I don't know. I don't know. What do you What do you call it? A game? I can't even tell. I'm saying we're done. We're not putting up with this project anymore. Unless you can pitch something to us that is the technical marvel you describe, I don't want to see it. We cannot keep sinking money Get into this. Get the fuck out! Connor seemed intent on making the video game to please his son, Pat, but didn't provide the product Mark and the company behind the Bucky IP had hired him to create. The final recording ends with the following message. Check the front yard, Pat. Grab the camcorder. I left instructions on how to add videos to my files. I know you don't use the computer much, but I truly need you to do this. I'm proud of you, son. You just need to do this for me. A final cutscene then plays out, looking very much like a found footage video. It appears to be someone filming a house with a camcorder before falling or jumping from the roof. After this, we return to the game as Bucky, finding ourselves in a vast open field. 
we head through the exits and the credits roll. Upon returning to the title screen, only Bucky remains, his eyes now missing. You may be a little confused as to what all of this means, and I don't blame you. You see, up to this point I've left out key information that helps explain the true story behind this cursed game. Although, bear in mind, how we put this information together and form a theory as to the real story is very open to interpretation. With that said, here is my take on the secret story behind Shipwrecked 64. To wrap up this video, we will break down the story of Shipwreck 64, or rather the story that occurred outside of a video game in the real world. To keep things as clear as possible, I will take a look at events in chronological order, referencing evidence where possible and making educated guesses where evidence is lacking. It all began with a company called Broadside, and more specifically, their animation department. Here, a worker named Mark Mullins first created the character of Bucky the Beaver and other popular animal mascots, building Bucky into a worldwide brand loved by millions. Okay, so a quick side note from the edit room, guys. When I first wrote, recorded, and edited this video, I believed Mark Lester to be the creator of Bucky. But Mark seems to be the current CEO of Broadside Animation. The actual creator of Bucky and the Broadside Company was a man named Rex, who died in 1972. We briefly see a video of Rex in the game, but he is never directly referenced. In fact, I only came across this information when browsing the developer's YouTube channel, where it was tucked away in a teaser trailer from nine months ago. Thankfully, it doesn't alter the rest of the story theory I had planned, but I did want to clarify things before we proceed. We learn of both this company and Mark's full name when exploring a folder hidden away in the game files titled Resources Ignore. In this folder, there are many cryptic teasers, found in both Notepad documents and ARG-based links to YouTube videos. We will use this folder to piece together the missing pieces of the puzzle that is this game's story. At some point, Mark hired a game developer called Connor Thomas, who was the head of his own development studio, Cogware. Together, the two companies, Broadside and Cogware, received a grant to license the Unreal Game Engine and create the Bucky the Beaver video game for the Nintendo 64, production beginning in the mid-90s with the game launching in 1997. However, it seems strange that the game launched at all. As we heard previously, Connor created a game made for his son Pat that barely resembled the Bucky franchise and its characters at all. This enraging broadside and Bucky's creator Mark, who pulled funding and kicked Connor off the project. Now we must put together our first missing puzzle piece. We saw the message where Connor asked his son Pat to find his camcorder and place all video files from it into the game code for Shipwreck 64. But what did these video files actually contain? Well, this is easy to answer. They contained the Bucky footage found throughout Shipwreck 64, those videos we witness upon failing each minigame. This footage showcasing a man in a Bucky suit killing various people. It seems logical to conclude that, as the camcorder belonged to Connor, he was then the cameraman who candidly shot these horrific events. But who were the victims, and who was in the mascot suit? These questions are also both answered in the game and those hidden files. The man in the suit was named Brandon Lester. We hear Olivia, an employee of Broadside, mention Brandon creepily standing outside her door, as heard on the recording earlier. She also appears on this YouTube video. Something about him just, just felt wrong, just horrible. Sometimes I swear he's not a person. It seems Brandon was hired to play the role of Bucky for public appearances, commercials, and other events that required a human to exist within a real-life mascot suit. He was the official character actor. It also seems like he was mentally unstable, as well as unliked by other employees. We can see from the date on these tapes that at least one murder occurred in the year 1990, well before the Nintendo 64 console even existed. So this suggests that Connor had witnessed Brandon's handiwork 
filmed it and then kept it a secret, now bringing the footage back out of retirement in order to expose Broadside as revenge for firing him from his dream project. Brandon's victims were Olivia Finch, Gary Wilson and Nathan Stewart. The only evidence informing us of which job roles these people had at Broadside Animation is found on unused video files in the Shipwreck 64 movies directory. However, the creator has told me that many of these files are outdated and should have been deleted before the game's release, so it's hard to know for sure if this data is accurate. However, as it's all we have to go on and doesn't contradict anything else in the story, let's take a look at them anyway. Olivia was said to be a voice actress working on the Bucky cartoons. One night she was invited by a visitor to the lake one night where she was then drowned. This makes sense as we find her medical report in a secret area full of water. Next we have Gary Wilson, who was a mascot handler at Broadside Vacation. One day after his shift, Gary went to the kitchen where he was attacked by Brandon. Finally, we have Nathan, who was an animator at Broadside Animation. He returned to the offices late one night where he met his fate with Brandon, all filmed once again by Connor. In this secret museum-like room, we see pictures of the various victims, all tied to Connor as his family house features as the centerpiece of this wall. A photograph of Brandon can be seen to the far right of the main collage. However, there is one key piece of this sinister story we have yet to touch on. You see, Broadside wasn't just an animation studio, they did have a less public side, a research and development department that seemed to dabble in human experimentation. Before we look into why, it is important to establish some context. While Bucky had been a popular cartoon character, it seems he had grown popular enough to warrant his very own theme park, a park dubbed Futureland 2020, which was part of Broadside Vacation. From one of the hidden notes, we get the sense that certain experiments were being conducted underneath this resort and covered up by security. These experiments were conducted to try and create living mascots, mascots that contained the bodies of humans within. This is detailed in those medical documents we find throughout the game. While these documents technically contain medical data, they are in fact application forms for mascot handlers. So where did these bodies used in the mascot suits come from? Why the victims of Brandon Lester of course. Each of these victims were on-site employees of Broadside, meaning their deaths were very easy to cover up by the company. The cadavers were then melded inside animatronic mascot suits and resurrected through some mysterious scientific procedure. These monstrous creations were dubbed starlings and each assigned a handler. The very first mascot created was Bucky the Beaver himself, using the corpse of Brandon Lester, who had died from fentanyl, a medicine used to treat cancer. In the secret notes folder we find a single document titled Cancer, directly linking to Brandon. As Brandon died from the medicine rather than his illness, it seems his death was a cover up on the part of Broadside, who then used Brandon's body in a starling experiment, one deemed successful by its handler Louis. Each of Brandon's victims then became follow-up experiments in a bid to hide his crimes from the world and save the public image of Broadside as well as testing out some new mascot technology. Everything had been going to plan until a disgruntled game developer named Connor with a history of Broadside's dark past decided to include lost footage of a rogue starling in his shelved video game. Then Connor suddenly passed away, at least based on this notepad document titled He Died, which seems to be written by Connor's son Pat. This is reflected in the final tape where we see someone leap from the rooftop of the Thomas family home. Once again this accident may have been down to a cover up on the part of Broadside, looking to rid themselves of an employee who knew too much. Connor's final wish was for Pat to insert the murder footage into the prototype Shipwreck 64, blowing the whistle on Broadside's shady past. Once these files were included, the game was printed and received a limited run, presumably so that Broadside could try to recoup their development costs, despite not liking the end product. 
Quickly realizing the damaging video files contained on the game cartridge, Broadside pulled it from retail, with only a few copies remaining in the wild. One such copy ending up on eBay years later by a seller named Daniel, and then replicated by a group of indie developers. Now the full story of these horrifying events is out in the open, yet it seems Brandon and the other Starling mascot experiments still roam the grounds of Broadside Vacation's Futureland Resort, able to kill at any moment. And with that, we come to the end of this video looking at the story of Shipwreck 64. I hope you enjoyed today's video and found it both entertaining and informative. If you did, remember to leave a like, comment down below, and of course subscribe for more horror related content. Thanks for watching, and I will see you on the next video.